Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 2,433. Today we're going to go to a very, very cool facility, so be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah! Today I'm in Westlake Village in California, beautiful part of the state, with a very special guest by the name of Tony Principe. Tony, welcome to Cars Yeah! Do you have any gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Pleasure to be on your podcast. Well, we're going to have some fun because uh, you've got some facilities that are just killer. And I'm aware of those because some of past guests that have been on Cars Yeah, they have told me all about this. Now, I want to give you a proper introduction and we're going to dive into what you've created. But before I do so, I always like to ask my guests this question, which kind of rounds out maybe some size of you we don't know. What's one thing that most people may not know about you, Tony? Oh boy, you mean that I could share? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I all mean, up to you, no, pal. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm a Southern California native, um, you know, born and raised here and grew up surfing and, you know, BMX biking and always a car guy. And uh, fortunately, with my business, how it's evolved and my hobbies, they've come together and I get to, to do a little bit of all that now as I've gotten older. So it's fun. Well, you've discovered the secret sauce to life and a lot of your youth sounds like what my youth was all about. So I'm a little jealous now that I'm up here in the Pacific Northwest where it's not as sunny and warm and I'm a long way from a beach other than the Puget Sound where the, the waves are only there if a tanker goes by, a submarine or an orca <laughs> whale. Uh, so nice. it's not, not very reliable. Let me let me give you an introduction because I'm going to dive into what you are creating there with your uh, your business partner. Tony Principe is the president and CFO of West Cord Commercial Real Estate Services and managing partner of TR Funding and the co-founder and managing partner of Finish Line Auto Club. He's an avid car collector and active in numerous automotive clubs and organizations throughout Southern California. Together, they have 90 plus years of commercial real estate experience that they have applied to every finish line facility. Each property is set in an automotive country club environment that caters to a luxury car condo lifestyle, providing safe locations for your prized vehicles. One of the unique aspects of the Finish Line Auto Club are the private events that are unique to each location, from cars and coffee gatherings to automotive unveilings, cocktail receptions, and distinguished speaker series. Each event is a curated, unique experience. We're going to learn a lot more about Tony and Finish Line, but first, a word from our sponsors. So give them a little love, and we'll be right back. Years ago, when it was time to renew my collector car insurance policy, my carrier's rates went up way up, but my usage was the same and I never made a claim. I didn't even have a ticket. So what's with that? So I turned to American Collectors Insurance. Has your collector car insurance recently raised your rates for no good reason? Tired of paying an annual membership fee? Then it's time to look around and call American Collectors Insurance. I shopped around, I asked friends for recommendations and found a winner that I can trust. And boy, I'm glad I did. I saved hundreds of dollars every year and slept better at night knowing my baby was properly insured. American Collectors Insurance have been protecting vehicles since 1976. They provided me with an agreed value insurance policy backed by their history of taking great care of their clients. What could be better than that? So give them a call and ask for a quote today. 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866-224-9324. And protect the ones you love like I did with American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. For several years now, you've heard me talk about Linkage Magazine. I've been a subscriber since the start. Their talented and creative team brings you a spectacular publication and website that shares the automotive passion from a worldwide perspective. Linkage is about driving, restoring, collecting, and firsthand experience at collector car auctions and more. They bring you real world values plus rational, experienced opinions on the current markets. They cover the automotive world and the people who share our passions. And Linkage Magazine has grown, mailing you six issues annually. Join me on this journey with Linkage. They're geared for the automotive life. You can subscribe at LinkageMag.com. 
So, Tony, I want to go back in time first, uh, talk about how you got into commercial real estate, what was so intriguing about this for you, and then how this business evolved into Finish Line Auto Club, because that's what brought you and I together today. I tell you, playing around in your website, I want to come down there and play with you guys. That is a cool place. But but let's go back to the beginning first. Well, I mean, as a kid growing up in, in Southern California and uh, just being uh, actively involved in all kinds of different things, sports and, and hobbies, you know, I was around go-karts uh, uh, at an early age and I delivered newspapers, saved up uh hundred dollars so I could uh, go out and buy a go-kart when I was about 10 years old. And, and uh, my dad took me down and we bought a, a McCulloch cart, which was fun. Probably wish I still had that today, but we went out and did some parking lot, you know, screwing around and stuff like that, but then realized that we wanted to get something a little faster and have a little bit more fun. So we went down to a place called Pitts Automotive down in, in Van Nuys and bought a couple go-karts and we started racing and just had a great time. So I was around kind of automobiles and, and speed and all that at an early age. My dad was in real estate, you know, started a real estate company in the early 60s and um, was involved with residential and commercial. So being around it my whole life, I always knew that was something that I had interest in. And, and um, as I got older um, and started, um, you know, enjoying cars and playing with cars, and I was actively involved with working. So I wound up, you know, when I was living, I moved down to Newport Beach for a little while mm-hmm. uh, while I was going to school and, and saw all these fantastic homes and boats and cars. And I just knew I wanted to dive into it. And so I got into real estate at an early age when I was 19. Wow. And there was no looking back for me. I just, I knew it was something. Thing I was really passionate about. I loved it. And so I did commercial real estate. I was doing brokerage, um, uh, office and industrial, and uh, from the family company. I was uh, really just uh, enjoying my time and learning and really grew my portfolio of clients throughout Southern California and started working on some bigger projects with, you know, companies like Intel and Amgen and a lot of, um, you know, individual developers and investors. And, and then I knew eventually I wanted to own property. That was really where my, my mindset was. So as I came up with ideas on buying this piece of land and developing it into whatever project I thought needed to be fulfilled in the market at that time. I would I would uh, build a, a model, a financial model and a story behind it. And I'd sell it to a client and I'd, you know, I'd get the real estate commission on it, but the real money was made owning the properties. Right. And so after testing enough theories with clients, I decided um, in 94, um, after closing a, a, a big real estate deal, I rolled my commission and convinced my dad to go in on, on a project with me. And I bought a, a burned down industrial building that needed to be redeveloped and uh, re- redeveloped it, leased it out. And that started what was TR funding. And, um, you know, we've done 50 plus projects over the years, which has really been fun. And that evolved eventually into finish line, which I'll talk about. But, you know, we um, we kind of touched a lot of different food groups from office, industrial, retail, a little bit of everything. Uh, while we were still doing brokerage and property management business, um, but as I, you know, became a little bit more successful in the business, I always wanted to buy cars and, you know, and I bought my first real collector car back about 20, 25 years ago, which was a, a 56 Porsche Speedster. Super. Oh, oh, wait, be still my heart. <laughs> I love those things. I've wanted one of those for my whole life. Yeah. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Yep. It's a great car. And, you know, it was different because I always had fast cars, yeah. but it was one of those things where every time I wanted to buy a car, I thought, you know, I wanted to buy at the time, I wanted to buy a 360 Ferrari when it first came out and, uh, and some in the 355 before that. But I kept holding off because I'd rather put the money in the bu- in the buildings. Smart guy. Yeah. And so, you know, but at some point I finally decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go buy a, you know, a fun car, I bought a 360 Spider and, and, um, and, and had some fun with it. But this, the, the Speedster was my first real collector car, if you will. It was kind of a separate non-daily driver. And, and over time I started to collect other vehicles, but I needed a place to store them. And, um, and that became a challenge. And then as my kids were young, I have two boys uh, that now are 24 and 26 and they work with me in the company. But at the time they were young and, and I had also experienced going in motor homes and things like that when I was younger. And so I decided that I wanted to purchase a uh, motor home and start uh, doing some traveling with the kids. So the challenge was that what was, where do I store it right. when, <laughs> right. when it's here? So I was renting facilities and doing this and that. And, Finally, an opportunity came up back in the in the uh, mid 2000s to buy uh, about a 40,000 foot industrial park that had 28 separate spaces in it, and so my dad and I bought it, 
and we cleared it all out, got rid of all the tenants and remodeled the whole place um, and wound up, um, I was going to take a couple units for myself. My dad was going to take a couple units and we wound up uh, putting a condo map on it so we could sell the unit. Oh, yeah. Well, it wound up, we're, uh, wound up where about 80% of those units went to car guys that wanted to put their car collections in there. And there became this little synergy going on within the complex. And, and we thought, you know, maybe this is something unique that we could tap into is to do a facility that was, you know, purpose built for car collectors. I did a couple of open houses and car shows and stuff there. And it was fun. We had a great time. People opened up their garages. So I started going on the hunt for land or other facilities and bought a, a five acre site in Calabasas. Um, shortly thereafter, thinking that would be the first what became Finish Line Auto Club. But that took me um, 11 years um, to get entitled and get permits and another <laughs> couple years to, to start construction. So ironically, I'm building that right now. And I've done multiple other finish lines that have opened and, you know, are in operation now. So it's kind of funny how, how you know, uh, time, especially with development in California, oh, gosh. Um, yeah. can, it can definitely uh, divert your, 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 your priorities. So anyways, uh, we wound up buying the next place was a, um, a 60,000 foot facility in Westlake Village where Volkswagen had a headquarters and turned that into the first finish line auto club. At the time, it was called finish line auto storage because mm -hmm. we thought it would just be storage facility with a clubhouse. And, you know, maybe we do some events. And, and as it became successful and everybody really enjoyed being a part of it, we changed the name to an auto club because it really became a social um, and automotive community. And so then we built a second phase there. So we have about 80,000 feet at the Westlake site. And now we're getting ready. We just got approvals for another 36,000 feet of garages and clubhouse um, there. So we're getting ready to do that one. But the big one was we went down to Orange County. And having lived there, I knew that was just a car capital <laughs> no down kidding. there. Yeah. And um, so I looked for about seven years and made offers on properties, but just wanted to make sure I got the right location. And so ultimately, I found an off-market deal on the John Wayne Airport next to the Lion Air Museum. And uh, it used to be uh, the Fisker Automotive Building. Oh yeah, okay. So they had design and engineering and corporate offices in that facility. And so this was an 80,000 foot building on four acres. And so basically, um, you know, was able to design that in a, in a really unique way to create 32 uh, garage spaces plus, plus a 7,000 foot clubhouse on that site. Wow. And, um, and then get approval for two more buildings on the site, which we're getting ready to build. But that that turned in, that kind of flipped the switch for us. Westlake was a really great facility. We did some fantastic events that we hosted for, you know, the Peterson Museum. We did charity events. We did a lot of fun stuff. But Orange County was the next level of, of facility for us. And, um, you know, at the time when I was building it is right, I closed escrow, started designing it. And then ironically, COVID hits. Mm. And I was thinking, oh, shoot, you know, yeah. how, how is this going to impact me? I'm doing this massive facility down there. And are people going to want to, you know, come to the garage and, and play with their cars and stuff like that? Ironically, it actually, you know, put fertilizer on the car market and really yeah. blew it up because people had time. Right. But yeah. there was as we finished the facility, um, there was a very big um, cars and coffee that had gone on for 20 plus years down in Crystal Cove. So that that unfortunately got closed down because it became so big and you could everybody could see it and drive by and they'd race their engines at seven in the morning and the neighbors hated it. So I met uh, one of my one of my owners at, at Finish Line Orange County was actively involved with that group. And so I, I remember meeting about 50 of them in a little coffee shop in, in uh, Corona Del Mar and offering up our place up at the airport. I said, you make all the noise you want. It's private. It's gated. You know, we don't have to worry about necessarily the public just coming to these. And so that started our, our cars and coffee events there, which have been just epic. You know, we, yeah. we wound up um, doing themed cars and coffees. So mm -hmm. every month we could do classic Ferraris or British invasion or things like that. And so it really um, became a, a fun atmosphere. But what happens with the finish lines are you buy a, a condo, a garage, you're within this community that's, that's deed restricted to collector car storage only. So there will never be another business in there. And there's been other since, you know, since the time we started in 05 with our original place, there's been a lot of car condo places that have happened all around the country. But 
we've tried to develop the the high end um the highest level if you would of that car club segment of the of the real estate market and um and we made sure a lot of them didn't deed restrict it to collector car storage so they'd soon dilute with other businesses you get jewelers and insurance people and oh, stuff and sure. it, so it lost that appeal so we we wound up doing that and um and then we created a beautiful clubhouse it's just stunning two-story clubhouse with wine cellar and bar and conference room and game tables and stuff and we started creating the social calendar around that where we did a speaker series where we've literally had formula one and motorsports champions and car designers and and you know all kinds of different enthusiasts and collectors and, and stuff like that. And that's really made it a, a fun atmosphere where people feel like they can go there, they can unplug, they can open up their garage and leave it open because the gate it's gated and secured. We have a lot of layers of security there. And then, you know, the unique part is because people can buy their space. They go nuts designing kind of their dream car garage, if you will. Right. And everybody's got a different vision of what that looks like. So you'll see some old gas station style and some, beautiful barns and modern facilities and everything from hot rods and race cars. Um, so it's really become just a, a, a really fun business. And, you know, obviously it's in line with my hobby, which is collecting cars. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, uh, a friend, Chris Erickson, the secret car club has been to your events there and, and posted pictures and things. And a couple of times I've tried to coordinate when one of your events is going on when I'm down there visiting. And I'm going to get to, to that event. And of course, Mark Foster, who put us together from the Lion Museum, said, you right. got to talk to this guy, Tony, because this place is crazy. And I said, I know, I've seen pictures of it. I want to go there so bad. So this is really fun of all this hard work of building your career in the commercial real estate segment and then saying, how can I tie this into my car passion? And you have done it in a massive way way and i'll tell you listeners i'll put links to the website easy to find but finish line auto club this place is it's insane yeah you've done an oh, awesome job you. yeah it's just it blows me away and some of the designs that owners have put into these i saw one where the gentleman put all bricks on the ceiling it looks like an old english barn kind right. of thing or something I'm like oh yeah. my gosh he, yeah he did a barreled a barreled ceiling with brick yeah. And old skylights that that wind up um, with almost like these portholes with lighting that can change the time of day yeah. that these um, these things look. So, yeah, no, they're people, their imagination just blows me away what they do. And the hardware, the cars that they bring in there yeah. are <laughs> yeah. the top of the food chain. And, yeah. and so, you know, you'll see, you know, D-type Jags and 550 Spiders and modern race. Yeah, just all kinds of fun stuff. So for me, it's, you know, just fantastic to show up there and you never know what you're going to see. Well, you've gone beyond just the, the man cave car condo concept with this club event atmospheres, putting on events, really, really brilliant. And I've had a lot of people on the show that do similar type things, but the level you take your, your facilities to your properties to is really, really inspirational. So I can't wait for the next time I get down there and I can come and visit one of these events. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you'll have you'll have to come down for oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. I'll keep in, uh, in touch with Chris because he seems to be there a lot. I think it's really, really cool. You know, I would assume you've had some very inspirational people around you. It sounds like your dad is one of those key drivers being in the business and bringing you in. And now you're going to be, now you're doing third generation with your boys, which is just right. wonderful. Would that be who is a, probably the most influential, inspirational person that's been in your life? Yeah, I mean, I think for business, for sure, I think that that he was really helped set some foundational um, concepts with me in the business and gave me the ability to have a platform to be able to kind of be creative and do the things I want to do. And then, you know, with that over time, you know, and that's the nice part of, of the real estate business is there's so many different facets of it. And through those different facets, you meet different people. And I've always found people to be fascinating and to learn their story and how they've done it and what they've done differently and what makes them tick. And I think that building my own client base and my own relationships and friends from that point forward really enabled me to um, develop further, I guess, mentoring, if you will. But it was mm -hmm. really just going in with my eyes wide open and seeing how people are doing things and, and what styles I liked and which ones I didn't um, and adopting some of those things into my own style of, of doing business. So, you know, I think that, that I've been fortunate that I, I had a, a good mentor that had started a business in real estate, had perspective. And I think that that I'm able to learn some of the, 
the original ways of doing things and then we were able to evolve and learn the new ways of doing things yeah. that, that I think I've brought to the table. And now with my kids being here, I get to see their way of doing it and, and try to evolve to with that and not get stuck in a particular way. But yeah, I've had, I've had a lot of different, I don't know if I would say mentors as much, but I've had a lot of influence from different people, even if they weren't necessarily realizing that they were um, a part of that puzzle, if you will. Yeah, it's important. Way, way, way back, my first job out of college was in graphic design and advertising. And for the first five, six years, the majority of our clients were commercial real estate brokers and developers. And I got to know a lot of them down in the San Diego County and Orange County area and watch how they worked and what they did. And I always loved it because my father was an architect. So he was tied into that world a bit. He did some projects himself, commercial projects and, and custom homes. But seeing these guys, and many of them were in companies, um, Coa Banker and um, Trummel Crow company and the different ways these companies, uh, John, what was the other? John Burnham and company. That was another one that was a big client right, of ours. Yeah. Right. And seeing how they worked and how they developed things and, and how the companies were structured. I learned a lot about it and uh, always enjoyed working on those projects. Everything from shopping centers to, we did some high rises in downtown San Diego, which were, were really, really cool. You No doubt, and you kind of alluded to one, there are challenges in the commercial real estate business. Uh, one of them is the bureaucracy of trying to get projects done. My wife was a civil engineer in Southern California for many years, California for many years, and talking about the challenges that the county put in their way of trying to do developments for their clients, which were commercial developers and housing developers. Can you share maybe a huge challenge that you faced in developing a property, but looking back, you're kind of happy that you had to go through it because it taught you maybe a painful lesson, but it taught you a really valuable lesson. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I could use you know the example of of the the land that I bought that's been eleven years in the yeah, making. I mean, I have to I have to think eleven years. I mean, how do you make the money work on that when you've got money invested in something and it takes that long to make it work? Oh my gosh! Well, you have to buy it right. Yeah, there you um, go. <laughs> and 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 you have to have a product at the end of the day that appreciates in value and moves up. You know, I was looking recently at at some of the underwriting I did when I bought it and what I, you know, originally underwrote for construction costs and also for resale value are grossly <laughs> under. Well, it's been 11 years. <laughs> right, but but also what's happened is is that the the, the sales values, the resale values have also moved up too. But yeah. ultimately, you know, you buy it right. I you know, I was, I was thinking about this and that, you know, I've been through probably three big real estate cycles. Um, and I think the biggest one, obviously, this the 2008 financial crisis. But, yeah. you know, we've had everything from COVID that shut down our buildings and kind of not wanting to pay rent. And I mean, it just it's all something always is being thrown at you in the business. And I think that it's important to a have fundamentals and principles as to your underwriting and how you buy something. And then not getting so caught up in future value. Oh, it's going to be here someday, right? I, I need to make it work today because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. As long as fundamentally it works today and and I buy it right. And two is having the cash to sustain those cycles that that because sometimes people are heavily leveraged and they just they've got to they're forced to, to to make decisions they don't want to make because they're not in a position to carry those properties and do that type of thing so i think it's really important that a that you have really strong fundamentals and underwriting you understand a market you understand the product type and you look at things on a long-term hold we're not flippers we don't buy and flip we hold long term i didn't expect you know the, the calabasas <laughs> project didn't yeah. take this long but ultimately, um, it, it, it should, you know, work out just fine, it, because even with the fluctuations in his interest rate markets and construction and so on and so forth. But it, it really, I mean, I can see if I put all my eggs in one basket and one development deal and it took that long, obviously, you know, you got to put food on the table and that's not going to work. So I think diversifying too and having, you know, pro- investments and, and income streams that come in irrespective of these cycles. And then you've got your kind of risk money that you put at play. Maybe that's the development piece. So, mm-hmm. so we've tried to, you know, balance our 
portfolio and our risk and and put you know maybe do our some of our risky but that's not all of the entire portfolio right there's some other stuff that's core assets that you hold long term and and in good markets even as bad as as you hear things about California and investing in California it's still a very strong market it's it's, it's if you buy in good cities and good areas and good product types with uh, buildings that have good bones solid bones to them they'll generally appreciate they'll continue to, to do better over time and so it's it, every day I learn something new I can't say that you know that I figured it out because tomorrow there will be something new that that comes around and and so I think it's it's also being able to adapt and change and not be stuck in what was done five years ago, 10, 20 years ago, you got to pivot and figure out, okay, what do I need to do today? Maybe I got to recycle this property and tear it down and build mixed use or do something different. But I think that's really the the key is being, you know, uh, flexible as well. A lot of creative thinking in this business that a lot of people I don't think realize and you think, oh, real estate, build something, rent it, sell it. Easy. <laughs> no, <laughs> right? not really. I hear a lot of young brokers that, because we have a brokerage company and we hire and train and, and do that, including my own boys that are in it. And I think every broker coming out of real estate school wants to be a developer. Yeah. You know, oh, I want to be a you know real estate developer. And it's like, you know, great. We all want that. But when you really dive in, and I think being a being in the brokerage business, you really learn what that business is like without using your capital. You get to pay, you know, you get to to be on the, you know, in the room, if you will, to fly on the wall and transact and create deals and works. And, and I've seen plenty of people whose ideas didn't work and they're gone. Today, and other ones who have thrived and grown and become these big companies and very successful at what they do. You get to experience that. Just going out and diving into something without having that experience, I think is it would be challenging. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you spoke about that first collector car, this Beatster that you bought. I always like to ask my guests about one vehicle they've had in their past. Could be a car they have today or, or that first collector vehicle to share a little story about that. Is there a different car than that Speedster? As much as I'd love to talk about Porsche Speedsters. Well, I mean, yeah, as far as, you I mean, an experience. Yeah, a car that stands out for you that you go, man, that thing was cool. One, it got away. I mean, I had a career GT for, for um, a long time and I bought it and really enjoyed it. Had it for about six years or so. And then I thought, you know, I, I sold it for what I bought it for. And then shortly thereafter is when the market just blew up on it. Oh, yeah. So I was like, I've always, you know, and I just sold it because it was sitting in the garage. I wasn't using it. I'd love to have it back. But I, I really like using the cars. And so I, I have to say that, you know, I have a GT2 RS that I recently took my son, uh, my older son up to uh, uh, an event called Hypercar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. which is up at Laguna Seca and, and brought him up. And, and I, I, I had a, a cup car, a track car that um, we also played with. And so I just had a blast up there and my son drove and I was able to experience that with him on the track, driving one of my cars and really enjoyed it. And, and those are things now I look at the car you know, because sometimes you, you keep cars long term, sometimes you might sell it. But now that car has a lot more meaning to me with those experiences. My 23 year old or 24 now learned to drive a stick in my 930 turbo, my 79 930 turbo. And so that instantly I look at it and say, well, wow, that's kind of a cool car that he got to learn how to drive his, you know, a stick shift, which is really hard to find these days. Mm -hmm. If you want to teach a kid how to drive a stick shift, you know, because no one has stick shifts that you can go rent, <laughs> you know, so yep. you can't rent a car and, and then return it after they're done with it. So you pretty much have to use your own cars, which is, which is fun. So anyways, I, I think that these cars have a lot of fond memories for me because I'm able to do things in them with family and friends. Yeah. That's the great thing about cars is those memories. Yeah. You know, I like to crawl into my guest head to be a little bit of a car psychologist. So if you were reincarnated as a vehicle, now this isn't what you want to be because that'd be way too easy. This is how you perceive yourself, the way your inner workings work, what you like about life manifest into a vehicle. What would you be and why? You know, I think that I probably would go with a 97 Porsche GT2 RS. Okay. I was thinking about it that I, I, I want a, a car that is visceral and is reliable. It's not a modern. There's all these modern cars that you can get into today and they're just, you know, they're fast and this and that. Um, and, and they're great. And there's older cars. You're not sure when you, when you go to them, they're going to start up. And I, I, you know, I, I've, I've had a lot of different stuff, but I really love Porsches and, and the Porsches are just great handling cars, but that, that, that GT2 RS is really a beast and it's fun. It's visceral. Um, it's, it's a little old school, but, um, it's just, um, to me, it's, it's got some character to it. It's, it's got some, uh, color to it, which is fun. 
And uh, so that's that probably would be what I would. It's a, it's a hard question <laughs> yeah. to, to answer, but but I think that that's probably in the spirit of where I would be. Well, last of the classic air cooled nine nine three cars, which you know that that was the end of an era, uh, which makes it right. even more special too. But then you had that RS on the end of it, the GTO. Oh my goodness, you got quite a special deal there. Now I, I like to ask about how guests like to give back, and I know that you sit on boards for a lot of different things, from Rotary Club to the California Museum of Art. So it sounds like you and your family are very big on giving back to the community. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, we're 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 big on giving back to the community, and um, we have some different. In fact, my wife um, started a nonprofit called the Phoenix Effect, where we help girls um, uh, at all different ages that have had cancer, life debilitating oh, wow. ailments, if you will, and we do highly curated photo shoots for them um, and give them coffee table books and stuff. And it's it's a really fun experience, but we're involved with a lot of different things um, just because it feels good to be involved with the community. We, we've been super blessed with, um, you know, our lives and, and business and and not everybody has that, that um, you know, opportunity. And so we try to, to do whatever we can. Yeah, it's wonderful. Spectacular. How about a great book that you'd like to share? You know, I, I, I do a lot of reading. And so I think that just, you know, mo- most recently, I, I read uh, the book called Shoe Dog. Oh, uh, yeah. By Phil Knight. Nike. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which was the story of Nike and talk about perseverance and all the things that he went through. And so often you you hear these companies that exist today that are gigantic. And, and you know, a lot of people look at them, oh, they're just this big company and these CEOs get paid too much. But if you really understood their story and how they spent all of their time and energy on the verge of going bankrupt and losing everything. And yet they kept going at it and at it mm-hmm. until they finally made it. Um, so I, uh, that's always inspiring to me. So I thought that was a great book. There's a, a book called Good to Great, which is great. And then my wife wrote a book recently called oh, really? uh, um, a, Co- a Common Thread, which is great. So um, I'd be remiss and not uh, well, yeah. <laughs> saying we that one as well. That. But. Is that book available like at Amazon and in other book it outlets? Is. Okay. Great. Yeah, it is. I'll make sure I put links to these on uh, Tony's show notes page so that you can get your hands on them. Of course, yeah, the, the Shoe Dog is a great book. And you know what I, I want to read that just came out was uh, Elon Musk's book, new book uh, that just came out. I'm looking forward to that uh, to learn more yeah. about. Yeah. You talk about these giants that do things. I just like, how do these guys do that? what they do? Uh, and they have the same hours in the day as I do. So uh, holy cow, amazing people. Perseverance. Uh, yeah, they yeah. Get drive. A lot of hard work and drive. That's for sure. Sleeping at the factory as, as Elon has talked about. So let's go on the ultimate drive. Now you're a guy who's been on many ultimate drives, I can tell, but this one's a little different because I'm paying for it. So I'm going to park any car you would love to have in your driveway. You can take it for a drive. And here's the fun part. You can take anybody with you, including somebody from the past who's no longer with us. So uh, if I'm footing the bill, what does the drive look like for you? You know, I, it's, I'm fascinated with so many people, but I think at the end of the day, I'd like to spend it with my family. And so <laughs> I think that if if you could put me in a old D-type Jag or a classic Ferrari and go do the Mila Miglia or some some rally and I could take my boys with me and, you know, maybe my my dad and, and do different legs of the drive yeah. and let them drive and, and, you know, and me drive it and just, you know, not only because you're, you know, you get to talk and, and, um, and experience that together, but you really bring some memories together. And I think that, that as much as it would be great to drive with world leaders and famous race car drivers and interesting people, um, which I, would be fascinating to me too. It, at the very end, I'd rather have that time with with my family. So I think that's probably who I would pick. Sounds nice. You've taken us on a fun ride today, Tony. And uh, again, I want to do a shout out. Thank you to our mutual friend, Mark Foster there at the Lion Museum who put us together. Uh, I think I told you when we chatted a few days ago, he was driving somewhere and was calling me with a question and said, hey, have you ever had Tony Principe on your show? And I go, no. <laughs> so here oh, we thank sit. You. Well, so there you go, Mark. Mark's a great guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mark's a great guy. He's actively involved, obviously, in the car community with the Lion Air Museum. And they're literally next door. Yeah. And And so not only is Mark at our facility um, a a fair amount because he's friends with so many of our collectors, but anytime we do a big event, um, he's eager to to bring cars over 
and participate. So uh, I a big shout out to Mark for uh, for what he does, and he's just a good guy. They've got some cool stuff over there, don't they? <laughs> oh my god! Oh yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. I, I I had no idea it was it was interesting because I knew it was next door and I hadn't been in it till after I bought the property. And then one day I went in there and I was blown away by all the, the oh you gosh. know the World War II airplanes and cars and motorcycles. It was just such a neat thing to have right next door. In fact, we created a a walkway between the two, between finish line and, and the Lion Air Museum. So when we do events, we can open it up. Yeah, Mark said he's got a secret pass, secret back door over there. Yeah, we do. <laughs> can go in. Well, <laughs> we and the do. Lions, those are some successful real estate developers in their own right. So, Oh, for sure. Yeah, there you go. Could you leave us with some words of wisdom or advice or a success quote as we part our way today? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I, it may sound maybe cliche, but I, I, I really would say, dare to just dream big and then go for it. I mean, I think life is short. And I honestly believe if you pursue a career or a business that you're passionate about, you can be successful at it and, and, and also be happy. There's a lot of people that chase careers and they just, they grind at it and they don't enjoy it. And they're not happy. And that, that's just not, to me, that wouldn't be fun. I mean, I, I think that if you're going to immerse yourself in something and enjoy it, and, and I absolutely love what I do, I've been doing it 37 years and every day I still pop out of bed every morning <laughs> and I'm excited about it. And, you know, and I, you know, I, I'm probably excited just to get that one project built after all those years. But, but I think that, that it just, for me, being passionate about something and enjoying it and also being able to understand that you've got to continue you to learn. If, if you don't learn and grow as a person and you you just feel, you feel like, oh, I know everything there is to know about this, then you're going to become irrelevant pretty quickly. So you really have to continue to evolve because there's so many amazing industries that were out there from the blockbuster videos and Toys R Us's of the world, which I hate to see go, but they've evolved into new you know, in new industries and as, as time has gone on. And I think that, that it's important, everything evolves. And so you just have to really understand that even if you're successful, whatever you do, don't rest on that. Just keep, you know, learning and being creative. And go for it. As Tony says, how can people learn more about Finish Line Auto Club? Well, the best is if you go on our website, which is finishlineautoclub.com, you can see all our existing facilities. You can see our events. There's videos on there. We have social media, which is uh, at Finish Line Auto Club. Um, we're on Facebook and Instagram. And, um, you know, we get a lot of people ask, how can we attend the events? And, you know, the challenging part is we're really a private country club, if you will, mm -hmm. for car enthusiasts. And so we don't do a lot of public events. Um, they're, they're primarily private and the owners invite their friends and guests to those events because it could just become so big yeah. that it, you know, um, it's it becomes challenging, but we, do, but we do do some events, uh, throughout the year, um, that, that we will announce on our websites or on our social media, whether it be the art of automobiles or other events that we do, we do some stuff at the Peterson Automotive Museum. And in those situations, we 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 may open those up. But that's that's been our the saddest part for me is I get I get so many inquiries. How can I come? And you know, and so and I love to have the kids there. We do a lot of stuff where kids come and see. Um, we're doing a big toy drive um, at our next Cars and Coffee um, for for uh, for kids for Children's Hospital of Orange County. But um, it's that's that's you can learn a lot about us on those those different sites, and you can always pick up the phone and call me if you want more details. We're opening up in other cities, and uh, we're looking for more locations. So um, I'm happy to fill you in on those details too. Very, very cool. Palm Desert, Calabasas is coming, Westlake Village, Costa Mesa, and more to come in the future. So check out their website, listeners. Insane what you guys are doing there. Tony, hey, thank you for thank taking you. a break out of a very busy schedule to, to share what you're doing well, with the Cartier you. listeners. You're welcome. Until you and I talk again, my friend, I'll see you at Finish Line Auto Club. Sounds great. Look forward to it. Thank you. If your car started today, well, thank a tech. If that truck delivering your goods today got to your home or your business, thank a tech. If that airplane you rode in took off and landed safely, and if that boat you're riding in arrived at the dock safe and sound, that's right, thank a tech. One thing the pandemic has taught us is that great techs keep America rolling. They are essential workers and we need them. Support career and technical education by getting involved with TechForce Foundation. It's a Cars Yeah charity of choice. Learn more at techforce.org today. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. 
drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah! Yeah!